Where are my slides? Uh, they're on the desk. There we are. Do I use this? Oh no, this one. Yeah, so, what's the view and then a uh, slideshow? Or that? No, slideshow. Oh, sorry. It's okay. So I was going to change my talk to uh, amusing tweets about the Brazilian soccer team, but I <laughs> backed out at the last second. It's 5 nothing Germany, for those of you who haven't been watching. 7 nothing. Okay, never mind. All right. Anyway, easy, easy. I'm sorry I brought it up. Okay, no, what I want to talk about is uh, the Journal of Statistical Software. And um, uh, the reason I'm talking to you about it is that I'm a new uh, editorial member uh, on this journal. And I'd like to encourage folks to submit uh, papers there, and I want to try to justify that here. So the uh, Journal of Statistical Software um, is a true open access journal. And by true, I mean uh, authors don't pay anything to publish there, and readers don't pay anything to read the articles. Uh, so it's all footed by UCLA uh, at the moment. It's uh, housed on their servers, uh, on their domain name, and, and, and paid for by them. Although in 2012, uh, um, Jan DeLeo, who's the editor-in-chief, uh, set up the Foundation for Open Access Statistics uh, that is hopefully going to fund this uh, in the future. So uh, what does the JSS publish? It will publish manuals and user guides uh, or any sort of description of your software, like vignettes and, uh, and various things. Uh, code snippets. They have a whole section of code snippets, which are smaller code projects. It uh, doesn't matter what language. Special volumes, these tend to be invited, um, but the, everything's peer reviewed. Uh, book reviews of books about statistical applications, software reviews. Um, some of the things of note uh, you have to submit LaTeX files as submissions. Uh, a weird thing that was almost a deal breaker for me is that uh, the software has to be GPL 2.3, and I I would never do that, but uh, some people do, and they, they insist on it. Uh, uh, but I, I submitted a paper a few years ago that was published, and, and uh, PyMC is under an academic free license, and they didn't ask me to change it. So um, but what you can also do is, is fork uh, your project and uh, put a new license on it just for that publication and proceed as you did, and, and, and that'll work too. <laughs> um, the thing is, JSS has this reputation of being an R journal, and it really kind of is right now. It's, it's heavily devoted to R, but uh, they've been hiring new uh, editors that are going to hopefully try to change that. So uh, Jake is on this, uh, John Miles White, in order to get some Julia stuff going on here. So if you submit a Python-related paper, chances are me or Jake will, will look at it. Uh, so that'll be good. Um, now, you may not care about um, impact factors. I don't really care about impact factors, but if you're an academic, chances are your head of department does. And check out the impact factor for the Journal of Statistical Software. Uh, the, these are statistical journals. It's number one. It's got almost a five. Number two is the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, and it beats that one. Look over at some co uh, computer science and computer science applications journals. It also tops that list as well. So. Um, you know, your, your department will probably like it if you publish here. So, Journal of Statistical Software. Look forward to seeing submissions. All right, so next up on the dock, we have uh, Matt Turk. If you'd like to come up and sit here, that'd be great. How do I open my slides? So, your slides. And some other wacky. Hi everyone, um, this is a, an introduction to Project Jupiter. Project Jupiter is uh, a project that evolved from IPython. IPython, uh, as, a, as some of you may have seen a little tweet, is something that brought me to this community 11 years ago. Um, and it has been evolving and over time, uh, we've been getting tired as the project grew in many directions of answering the question, well, why do you keep calling it IPython if I can do Julia, or if I can do R, or Haskell, or Go, or any of the other 15 languages that now operate in our, in our architecture? So we kind of took a look, a long look at what is IPython, and, and very briefly, 
These are some of the pieces that make this weirdly scoped project that we call IPython. It is an interactive Python shell at the terminal, and uh, it continues doing that. Um, that shell, those ideas have been abstracted into a network protocol for interactive computing, and Lorena made a number of really amazing points this morning about what interactive computing is, and those hit close to heart, obviously, for us. It provides a kernel that speaks that protocol. Um, it provides clients for that protocol uh, based on the terminal, based on a Qt console developed by Nthought, uh, the notebook that has seen a lot of press in this audience. Um, we've developed uh, a file format and machinery around the idea of these notebooks, um, web services like the Notebook Viewer. Um, and everything on the left is really, really specific to the Python programming language. But everything on the column on the right is completely agnostic of the language that you're using. And ultimately, we're a project that wants to think about science, about communicating computational knowledge. The fact that people from our community, like Chris and Jake Vanderplas, are engaging with what, with what was traditionally in our world, um, the fact that we've had tutorials about Julia here matters a lot. And so we're sort of moving in this direction of growing the project into this new project um, called Jupiter which is inspired by what I think are the three open languages of science, which are Julia, Python, and R. Um, it's not an acronym. As I said, it's inspired by, by these, but we're def defining protocols and machinery to make all programming languages equal class citizens in the architecture. Um, we want to acknowledge the long history of that astronomy has played in our community, um, from the work of the Hubble Space Telescope and the original funding for the Chaco project all the way to the continued maintainership of Matplotlib. Um, and we also want to play homage to Galileo, whose notebooks were the first open science uh, papers. Um, there's a great blog post that I encourage you to read from Authoria about how science was always meant to be open that looks at Galileo. This is, these are Galileo's original notes um, of his observations of the moons of Jupiter, um, which when he published the Sidereal Messenger in 1610, he, turned, he actually published his observations with code and data, and they included, a, it was a log of the dates and the state of the night, so there was data, there was metadata, and there was a narrative. So the first notebook uh, was about the moons of Jupiter in 1610, um, and we're sort of trying to continue that tradition. Um, who's doing this? Obviously, the existing IPython team um, and the existing IPython community, but we've already had wonderful participation of folks from the, from the Julia team um, in a lot of this effort, um, from the Google, from uh, teams at Google and YT that you'll hear about soon, um, but more importantly, from those of you who care about growing open computational science um, in other directions. So the next things that we're doing, some of it is grunt work. We have to work moving anything that's new in language agnostic is moving to the Jupiter organization. Uh, we're going to have a lot of technical work to do splitting up the monstrosity of our main repos into independent components, and that's going to be hard. It's not going to happen overnight. But more importantly, we want to build a community across languages of protocols, protocols for computation across networks. That's kind of the heart of what we've really kind of imagined in the last few years, an architecture of clients and servers that speak these protocols, open formats for communication and publication in, in, in whatever ways, whether it's books or so scholarly communication or uh, presentations, and tools for collaboration and education, um, tools like uh, the multi-user IPython notebook that many of you have asked us about and that we are working on, um, and uh, the collaboratory, which is uh, the next talk by Kayur. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. I have to admit that uh, when you said Galileo and notebooks, I thought Galileo was a project and notebooks were IPython notebooks. So, this is wrong. Um, so, up, up next on the dock is uh, Robert Lupton, and uh, our collaborator is now. Hi, everyone. I'm Kayer, um, and this is some work that my team has been doing on collaborative data analytics with the Jupyter folks and Matt Turk. Um, so, let's talk about how graphs are made. So this is a graph I made when I was teaching a machine learning class at Google. And this is two homework assignments, and one is bigger than the other. So how is this graph actually made? There are a lot of different steps that go into this. So first, I have to actually talk to domain experts, educational experts, machine learning experts about what data to collect. I put it in a storage system that I don't know how to use. And then I ask my friend, hey, how do I actually get the data out of the storage system? And he teaches me how to write these queries internal to Google, which are externalized um, as well. 
about um, getting them into a CSV format. Now that they're in CSV, I can use the tools that I know and love. I can use matplotlib and Python, and I get a graph. And so it doesn't really end here. I have to then share this graph with other people. I share it with the machine learning education team, and then I share it with my team that's working on analytics tools, and we're creating a presentation. And then this isn't just where it ends. People have opinions. So Jack, who's one of our education coordinators, is just saying, did somebody just look at the answers and not do the homework? And my PM actually wants to look at a histogram over time. And eventually, we're going to share this with our VP. So this is what analytics looks like. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are a number of different people that work on it. People work in teams. And collaboration is key to analytics. So what do I mean by collaboration? I'm talking about horizontal collaboration, people with heterogeneous skill sets working together to solve a problem. I'm talking about vertical collaboration, letting your boss know you're doing something important and affecting business decisions and work decisions. And I'm also talking about collaborating with myself in the future who's going to hate me when I can't reproduce my results. So that's what collaboration is. And that's not just collaboration at Google. It's everywhere in civic organizations, in scientific organizations, in journalism. We've talked to a ton of people, sat with them, and figured out what their problems are. And this is key. So we saw the IPython notebooks and a great way of doing this literate computing. And we thought we could make it even better. And I'm going to talk about how we're doing this in the front end. So first of all, we wanted to make it really easy to start. So now your notebooks are stored with your Google Docs. They're in directories alongside your presentations and documents if you use the Google Doc infrastructure. And you can launch it just like a, a regular Google Doc. So now where do I do my computation? So Matt's been working on some great stuff with one of our teammates, Kester. And they've actually put the entire IPython environment within Chrome in NACL. And they're giving a talk on this on Thursday. So you should go check it out. So you can, in one click, install an app and get IPython running. It's awesome. So we also want to make it easy for people to work together. Now that I have a notebook, I want to share it with people on my team. So you can sure, share like you share a Google Doc. You can also collaboratively edit documents, just like you would a Google Doc. And you can look at the output. So you can get inputs and outputs collaboratively, so two people can work at the same time. We want to make it easier for non-programmers, or people who don't want to program. So here's one way we're doing it. Let's say you have a block of code. Here are like three, three variables. I can parameterize them, which brings up this view, which creates a parameterized form. And then I can hide the code. And so now we can actually interact with just a parameterized um, widget. And people can actually take large bits of code, hide boilerplate, and, uh, and put this so uh, non-programmers can actually use it. We're also adding commenting, which is coming soon, just like Google Docs commenting. So here's what it looks like. There's a front end. We talk to the Google APIs. And we talk to a Jupyter back end. And there are two ways of using it. There's a Chrome app, which everything runs in Chrome. And there's a classic mode, which is just like using IPython. You have a cloud solution, or you have a local solution, um, which you can actually access from your cloud or your local solution. So how do you get it? So tomorrow, we're going to be opening the repo. It's part of Jupyter. And we're really excited. So you can actually check Google Plus or Twitter. We'll announce it tomorrow. And um, I want to put a little caveat. This is pre-release alpha. There's a lot of things that we're still working on, getting this code cleaned up and integrating into Jupyter. Um, and so please bear with us, and we'd love your contributions and help. Again, this is my team. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Teams abhor, abhor a vacuum. I learned this this time. So, Matt. Thank you. Um, and next up on the dock, uh, we have Hamid. So if you could come down, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Matt Turk, and I wanted to talk about something that I've been super excited about lately, um, indexing. <laughs> there we go. All right. So essentially what I wanted to start out with was sort of describing it in three different levels. Right? You can imagine thinking about data in a couple different ways. The topmost level is sort of the, what are the bits? What are these bits on disk? What, or in memory, or across the wire? You know, are they on, are they off? And so on and so forth. And I guess the next level of this is, where are the bits? Let's say that you have a whole bunch of them, and they're distributed over disks, over websites, over URLs, any of these things. And then the final level, is why are the bits? And this is applying some sort of degree of semantic understanding to these bits, right? Because the only difference between line noise and my thesis. <laughs> anyway, 
We can think about this in sort of a hierarchy, right? This is what I, I uh, like to call Warren's hierarchy. The idea of what are the bits, where can we find them, and then how do we apply some type of meaning to them? How do we interpret them and do something with them? And now this relates to the idea of software infrastructure. Now software infrastructure is sort of a continuum. If you imagine breaking it up into the generic software and the specific software, you can think about back in the day, the generic software was really just the math. Everyone wrote their own solvers, their own algorithms, their own I.O., their parallelism, analysis, visualization, so on and so forth. And then as time went on and new tools were added, things like parallelism, algorithms, visualization moved into the generic. With tools like Visit or MPI or Petsy and so on and so forth, we see domain nonspecific tools that address these issues. And as time goes on and on and on, what we see is we see these things moving. We see things moving inexorably from domain-specific to generic tools. And that's where the, the level of indexing comes in. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately because I realized a little while ago that a tool that I work on called YT is really just an indexing system. A couple of days ago, uh, somebody came to visit me. Um, and we took one of his axially symmetric seismology simulations, which was generated with a code called AxiSem. You'll never guess where that name came from. And we loaded it into YT, where we regarded it like a particle data set. And then we were very easily able to do a nearest neighbor interpolation on this and regard it with some sort of semantic meaning by indexing it the same way we would a particle data set. And then just by, and you probably didn't notice because I flipped back and forth very quickly, but with only a few lines of code, we're able to do, go from a nearest neighbor to a, an inverse density weight. And we can apply, again, semantic meaning to these bits that are organized somewhere on disk. And we can go into 3D. This is a, a, a shot from, from a movie I will show in just a moment of a fully three-dimensional seismology simulation that we're analyzing the same way we would a molecular cloud in the galaxy. Does anyone want to guess what this is? Nope. It's an MRI of the PI of the Neurodome project. And again, we're analyzing this the same way that we would anything else. And this is a disk simulation where everything's R, Z, theta, things like that. And this is uh, one of the largest n-body calculations ever performed. It's something like 10 to the 12 particles, something like that. And it's all been visualized using YT by Sam Skillman, who's sitting at a, a table over there. And in fact, this is larger, higher resolution than the LSST is, uh, the simulation. And does anyone want to guess what this is? No. <laughs> no, it's more fun than that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Here's a hint. This is all of the monsters from the shareware episode of Doom plotted as we would a galaxy. And it's hideous. I know, I was under the impression Matt Terry wasn't coming this year, so I thought I had to step in and give the Matt T talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so this is a simulation, and the whole point of this is that indexing is super powerful because we can apply semantic understanding on top of it. This is a, oops, let's see if I can make this play, the YouTube video. This is, and pardon the fisheye, this is a dome render of a seismology simulation of the Tohoku quake. Now it's a dome master, so you probably can't make it out, but there are in fact continent lines on it. So using the same indexing systems that we do for nearest neighbor calculations, all these different things written in Python that we do for our astronomy simulations, by turning them into domain generic tools, we did a planetarium show a week and a half ago. So that's end, right? Yeah, okay. So anyway, you should also check out the National Data Service at nationaldataservice.org. I had a cool way of tying it all together, but. <laughs> <laughs> Matt T, everyone. Uh, next up, we have Steven, Steven Sylvester. Yeah, go away. What have I done? Hey, brain dead. Oi. Somewhere underneath here, somebody has hidden my talk. But I can't find it. Maybe my fingers are wrong. Just, how can this would kill the window? But that's probably not what you want me to do. That would be kind of rude. Lupton, that one. OK. No, if, um, yeah, yeah. Full screen. I think we want full screen. OK. We had a great segue coming in there. Somebody said good things about astronomy. And somebody said good things about the LSST. So I thought I'd give a quick rundown on this. No, I don't want you to do that. 
So, the LSST is the Large Service and Optic Telescope. It's coming down the pike pretty fast. This is a real telescope. And what does that mean? It means the three mirror telescope. This is what happens if you waste too much CPU time on making pretty pictures of the optics of a telescope. Um, the sky does not look like this down in Chile. It's clear all the time. It's a real project. Here is the primary mirror. That's an 8.4 meter mirror uh, with people sitting in it, some of who are Jake Van der Plas colleagues at University of Washington. That's what the mirror looks like if you grind the center part of it out. I can stand closer to here or get feedback loops. Do you want feedback loops? No. Okay, so that's actually what the mirror looks like with the tertiary cut into the center. That's what the camera looks like. So um, that's a full-size person. She's kind of short. She's, the, she's called Nadine. So that's what a big astronomical camera looks like. To give you a better idea, that, that's the, on the left, that's all the CCDs. At the right, that's nine, well, it's actually one, two, three, four, five, uh, seven out of nine of one little subset of that is colored blue. If you look carefully, you'll see a picture of the full moon superimposed on that focal plane. This is a big instrument. The full moon's half a degree across. This is 10 square degrees. So the numbers, that's 3.2 gigapixels every 17 seconds. That's a 16-bit A to D. So if you go through that, you'll come out with 400 megabytes a second every time the shutters open. So it's fortunately dark about half the time. It's cloudy some of the time. So we gain a factor of two or three on that. You lose a factor of two the moment you convert to floating point, of course. Those numbers come out at about 20 terabytes a night. 60 petabytes over 10 years for the raw data, and data reduction is kind of a, not exactly accurate. That'll be about 15 petabytes in the databases. The data reduction system is quite a large Python C++ system. I'll show you the timeline in a moment. If we were building this now, this would be running on a top 500 class machine. So that's something like uh, 1750 nodes, peak compute power, nearly two petaflops, and a max core rate of something like 10 to the 5 cores. So, big machine, big data, not on the scale of the LHC, but in astronomy we care about our bits, we don't throw them away. Um, this instrument is capable of covering the visible part of the sky every three days. So, over the course of 10 years of operation, we get 1,000 images of each part of the sky say 200 in each color. So you're gonna make a movie of the sky, that's why we can't throw this away. Things blow up, things are very rare, you want to find them. Okay, Python. So here's a piece of production code, in fact, looks like Python. Everything that I've now colored in green is actually written in C++, so this is a classic C++ hybrid system. We're actually using Swig, because I hate boost Python. Um, that's not necessarily the right solution. Maybe Python's the right solution in a year or two. I think it isn't quite there yet. A little bit piece more. So that's a piece of Python that does the serious work of writing a real image processing analysis detection system that actually has most of the bells and whistles we're going to be using on these 20 terabytes of data. What's the status of the project? You can't read that, so I blew it up. This is from Nigel Sharp, who's a program officer at the, PR, at the NSF. I have authorization to share the following statement. The National Science Board authorized the Deputy Director to make an award for, to Aura for the construction of the LSST, subject to a few remaining issues. The issues are things like, you say you're going to buy a computer cluster in 2022. Can we see the quote? No. <laughs> well... Here's how we did the numbers. Can we see the quote? Uh, well, no. So we're going through this. There's a good chance it'll get resolved in the next week. Here's the, no, seriously, we were expecting to get a construction start 1 July. We're just haggling with NSF at the moment. This is a $473 million construction project, plus money from DOE, including 10 years operations. You can't read this, but it tells you we're going to get first light around 2020, first operations 2022. So how do you get involved? First of all, here's the source code. It's under the GPL. It's in Git, not currently mirrored to GitHub. And finally, and most important, I'm looking to hire people. If you want to work on algorithms, here's your chance. We're doing fun things. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next on the dock is Eric Bray. How do I find this? I think I saw it on the desktop. Mm -hmm. PDF on the desktop. Oh, it's a PDF. Is mm -hmm. this one? Here? Yes, that's. Okay. 
Okay, hello. Uh, so my name is Hamid. Um, so, oh, it's kind of going on its own. Let's stop here. That's okay, I'll go to the next slide. Well, so I'm gonna be talking about Python for navigation and estimation. Um, I'm a graduate student that works on uh, navigation systems, and uh, it's not in the sky, so it's only like maybe 100 or 200 meters above the ground level, uh, but, uh, but it's still fun stuff, so. All right, so uh, when I say navigation and estimation, uh, what I mean is it's kind of like sensor fusion or data fusion. Uh, you have multiple quantities and you're trying to fuse them together to come up with something you care about. Uh, in the aerospace department, it's usually something like position, velocity, and orientation of, of, uh, of the vehicle. And here I have an example of that. So uh, you have uh, sensor measurements coming in uh, from one side. Like here I have the gyros, which measure rotation rate on, an, uh, on a small airplane, for example. And you have other sensors uh, like accelerometers that measure acceleration, magnetometers uh, that measure the magnetic field, and you want to fuse all these to come up with the 3D orientation of, uh, of the aircraft. And uh, typically the uh, sort of the workhorse that's, that's used in, in the aerospace de uh, department, specifically controls and, and navigation, is, is MATLAB. And, uh, and I think for good reason, they do, they do a very good job. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think everyone needs to, needs to use that. So, I mean, what's good for building uh, Boeing 7, uh, 7 or triple sevens may, may not be what you want to use for a small UAV in a research lab. And, uh, and as, as part of this design step, you have, you're working with your sensors, you're you know, calibrating and characterizing sensors, uh, you're designing your algorithm, um, you're, playing, uh, you're playing with you know, different, different ways of fusing the data. Ultimately, you're implementing it into some kind of C code and flying it, and then coming back and playing the data and getting some kind of results, and, and for example, some visualization. Uh, so here is, here is uh, like one visualization of a uh, uh, attitude estimation system, so uh, the three angles that define the orientation of, a, of an airplane. Um, and uh, this was playing back data that we collected at the University of Minnesota. So for example, the top the top plot is, is the heading angle of the airplane, and uh, you could change the algorithm, play it through again, and, and look at the results. And uh, what I've been doing is, is starting to use Python for uh, this, this sort of work. So uh, doing design of uh, navigation systems or estimators, and playing the data through that, and uh, using the visualizations of like, matplotlib. And I feel like the, the sort of architecture that that, uh, that, that's available in Python is, is very empowering, and there's a lot of potential for applying it to uh, aerospace applications, and particularly aerospace research applications, like small, uh, small remote-controlled airplanes um, or other sort of uh, research uh, aerospace applications. So uh, what I'm showing here is, is uh, I mean, there's a lot of different data that, that you work with. It may not be climate data, it may not be uh, camera data, but I mean, each of these aircrafts have, have tens of sensors coming at high rates, and uh, being able to then play through that data um, is, is quite valuable. And here I'm plotting ground tracks for seven different flights, and, uh, and uh, all, all sort of done in, in, in Python, and uh, some of the, the research work that I've done with that. So lastly, um, when, when you move from, from, a, from an environment that you're used to, like Map, Map, MATLAB, uh, there's, there's a lot of utilities that you take for granted that uh, allow you to just you know, move forward, these, uh, these basic utilities. And as soon as you move to a new environment, you realize, oh, you know, that coordinate transformation, how do I do that? Or you can do it all, but it really slows you down. So what we're working on is, is trying to set up those basic utilities so that um, we have sort of a standard playing field of building more advanced applications on top of that. And uh, the library that we're working on is, is NavPy. Um, we're, we haven't officially released anything yet, so it's a work in progress, but I just wanted to get the word out there if there's other people working on aerospace sort of applications or dynamics and navigation applications, I'd uh, love to get in contact with you uh, so that we kind of evolve together as opposed to kind of all going off in our own directions. Thanks. Thanks. I like the idea of a workhorse in aerospace. Um, so. Uh, next up on the dock, since I made a mistake about Eric, uh, could we have Kurt Smith and Bill Spots, please, in that order? Thank you. Where's your uh, web browser? Just over the tab here. Okay. Yep. This is going to be a little more informal. I'm basically here to evangelize. Uh, how many of you were basically forced to do an assignment in MATLAB in college where they said, oh, you need to do this by next week, and oh, by the way, learn MATLAB to do that? So a good number of you. 
Um, well, I was in that uh, situation. I came out of college. I, I went to work, and I, there was no MATLAB license, so I, I didn't know how to write code anymore. Um, I didn't really know how to use a C++ compiler. We had one course in, but I didn't know what to do. Um, finally, I did get one for, for doing some research, but then I started to want to uh, do some image processing. Well, I got to go figure out how to pay for a toolbox or get my employer to pay for it. Um, instrumentation, the same way, talking over the, uh, the internet. Things that you, you, you think would be taken for granted, uh, everything you try to do, you run to a roadblock. There's been a lot of uh, blogs written about why MATLAB isn't a good platform for uh, scientific uh, research, um, so I'm not going to go into all those reasons. What I'm trying to talk about today is, is, is how to answer the question as an evangelist for Python. Oh, well, I'm used to MATLAB. I have all these M files sitting around, or I collaborate with other people that use MATLAB. Uh, what do I do about this situation? And that is what drove me to write the Octopi language, or pa package. So essentially, G GNU Octave is a cross-platform program that aims to be syntax compatible with MATLAB. It essentially will do anything MATLAB can outside of the core toolbox, um, the core implementation. Uh, I mean, it does the core implementation, and um, it doesn't do, there are some packages built on top of that, but it doesn't do any of the graphical pieces of it. Uh, so if you have basically a number crunching script written in MATLAB, um, you can call it from Octave. And what, what Octopi is is a, a Pythonic wrapper around that that basically slaves the Octave session, so you're writing your, uh, the rest of your code that interacts with the outside world, system programming, uh, plotting in, in Python, but uh, you can reuse those, those <clears throat> M files that you have sitting around. Uh, also, what used to be part of the IPython ecosystem, and now I've broken out into its own program, is uh, octopi.ipython octave magic. So you can run octave code within your IPython notebook, and there's, uh, plotting is automatically handled for you. Uh, so you can get ugly MATLAB plots, or you can uh, take the data and plot it with better Python plotting tools. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, in short, I, I just wanted to get the word out about this, this program and, and uh, evangelize for getting people away from the MATLAB shackles and uh, in, into the scientific Python community. Thank you. Cool stuff. Um, Kurt, are you in the room? All right, so uh, next up, we're gonna have Bill speak, and uh, on the dock, could we get uh, Jonathan Frederick and David Sanders, please, if they could come up. What? All right, okay. Um, uh, then Austin Bingham, so after that. N no, so there's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is the, you, you, I'm going to cross your name off of the list kind of thing, so, uh, all right, uh, let's see if that works, hmm? yeah, okay, okay. So uh, the, the original idea was for Kurt to speak first and then me, uh, but we will, we will wing it. <clears throat> um, okay, so Kurt and his collaborators at NThought are working on something called DistArray. These are distributed arrays. The idea is to come up with um, uh, multidimensional data, much like a NumPy array, except it would be distributed on a you know, distributed architecture machine. Um, and then the, the additional idea there would be to have uh, as much of the NumPy interface applicable to the distributed array as it is to a normal serial array. Uh, my uh, part on the project is uh, to take my project, which is PyTrolinos. PyTrolinos is a, a Python interface to Trolinos, which is Sandia's suite of solver technologies, built from the very beginning to be distributed and make sure that it interfaces with distarray, that it can take distarrays as data, uh, apply the solvers, and, and produce output in, in the form of distarrays. Uh, <clears throat> one of the really successful things about NumPy was the, uh, the, bu the, the buffer protocol. Uh, this is independent of NumPy, 
and it's a way of uh, compiled C or C++ or Fortran code to interface with uh, 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 Python buffers. And, and we wanted to do the same thing for uh, Distray. So I was going to discuss the Distray protocol real quickly, let you know, um, you know if you have some kind of uh, compiled code out there that's distributed and you want to ultimately link up to Distray, uh, this is how you do it. So uh, we start with, um, let's see here, if, if you can read it. There's uh, uh, this underscore Distray object that would be a part of your uh, 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 Distray, <laughs> part of your distributed uh, data. And it's going to have uh, attributes, version, buffer, and uh, dim data. The version tells you the version uh, of the protocol you're using. Buffer is a normal uh, uh, buffer you know, that follows the buffer protocol. And then all of the mapping uh, for the uh, distributed part of the, the problem is going to be in this dim data uh, object. Dim data is a tuple of dimension dictionaries. And dimension, dic dimension dictionaries are actual Python dictionaries, and then they have different attributes depending on uh, uh, how your data is distributed. <clears throat> so there's a type attribute, and this can be block signified by B, cyclic signified by C, or unstructured signified by U. Uh, and then the type will determine what other types of attributes are in your dictionary. There are a bunch of common attributes. If it's block, uh, you have to give it a start and stop index. If it's cyclic, you just have to give it a start index. And if it's unstructured, you have to give it uh, a, uh, something that follows the buffer protocol that indices. It's just a list or an array of, of indexes. The block protocol has um, optional keys. Padding, we allow for communication padding and boundary padding for finite difference operations. A periodic flag to tell you whether the, that dimension is periodic or not. Uh, for cyclic, there's also a block size to tell you how large uh, each block is as you cycle through your processors. And uh, for unstructured, there's a one-to-one -one, uh, key there. So if you have a 2D problem, you're going to have two of these dim dicks. If you have a 3D problem, you're going to have three of these dim dicks. And um, that collection of, of dimension dictionaries is going to be is completely describe the map between uh, uh, your local serial data and the global parallel problem. Uh, we believe that this covers almost all the cases that we're aware of uh, for interfacing with various different types of uh, uh, parallel designs that have been um, out there and in use for a while. And so it's through this uh, protocol that you would um, you would uh, interface between uh, uh, a Python disarray and whatever your compiled distributed data is. Okay. Thank you. Um, so a, a quick correction if you're there was a little confusing note that was written on the top that said Wednesday on the second page uh, that wasn't uh, officially supposed to be there. So that confused some people. Um, so uh, if you're in the room and you tell me tomorrow and you are on that tomorrow page, I won't cross you off and you can go tomorrow. But you really should give a talk. Uh, so um, if we could next up, is Austin Bingham in the room? Nope. Okay. Yeah. As did a lot of people. Um, are you ready? Well, I like that attitude. Uh, and then uh, Michael Zingale after that. So, oh, so you're just on the dock for for next. Yeah. Let's see. It does, doesn't it? I'm afraid if I zoom out, you guys won't be able to see. Can you read the text? Yeah. Is that? OK. OK, cool. Um, so those of you that don't know me, my name's John. Um, I've been a core IPython developer for a year. I guess uh, now 
I'm a core Jupyter developer as of the past 20 minutes. Um, so one of my big projects on the IPython team was to uh, implement the interactive widget framework. Um, so I do a lot of cross Python, cross JavaScript development, constantly going back and forth between the two. Um, and programming in Python, I'm a very happy programmer. When I jump into JavaScript, I just want to bang my head on the keyboard. Um, so while I was at the conference attending some of the tutorials, I had this idea, um, why not expose JavaScript objects to Python directly? So I started doing that, and in 24 hours, I had a working uh, demo. Uh, and originally, I thought the talk was going to be tomorrow, so I would have had something cooler to show you guys, but uh, right now it's just some basics. So to use it, you construct this JS object, and then um, that creates a handle to the JavaScript window, which is kind of like the globals dictionary in JavaScript. So in this cell, I'm going to access um, ipython.version, which is actually one of our JavaScript uh, variables. And this, oops, looks like it's not printing. Restart the kernel. Reload the page. There you go. So immutables are returned back into Python. So that's the standard uh, REPL showing uh, just a string returned from JavaScript. In this next cell, I'm actually going to access the API for interacting with cells in the notebook. So this is something that normally you would have to implement in JavaScript. So I do ipython.notebook dot get cell zero, so I'm getting a handle on the first cell in the notebook in the web browser, and then accessing the um, DOM element and changing the background color to blue, which is a jQuery call. And so when I run that, you see the first cell actually changes. And I'm doing this completely, completely from Python, so no, no uh, JavaScript programming needed. Um, so this next cell, I create a variable uh, A, and I set it to three. Um, and I'm doing that in JavaScript. And then I print that variable from Python, set it to four, and then print the change variable. And you see it actually does update and to um, verify that it is being set in JavaScript, if I do A in the console, you see it's four. So that's completely propagating through. This example is a little more complex. I create an object that has an attribute my value uh, which is set to six, and then a function which eventually will accept that object and return the attribute of it multiplied by two. In this next cell, I pull that object into Python, and then I pass it back into JavaScript, run that function, and then print the return back in Python. And so if I execute that, you see six times two is 12, so that's working. Um, so for those of you that are curious how this works, there's a um, JavaScript object that I've written that has a get adder, set adder, a call, and um, a callable attribute that just is uh, proxied over into JavaScript. Um, so let me scroll down a little bit more because I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, so one of the cool things that you could do is you can overwrite things in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, the uh, equivalent to print is console.log. In this cell, I'm going to overwrite console.log with Python print. So then if I run JavaScript code to do console.log, you see that it prints to Python print, and it shows up. This is a little bug. It should have printed to the cell with the JavaScript, but uh, it's a minor bug. So, and then getting uh, a little bit more complicated uh, using the same things I've showed you guys, I can actually access the uh, IPython notebook uh, header image here, and I can register a JavaScript event that will fire off a piece of Python code, which will then change uh, the document. So what will happen is when I scroll my mouse over the notebook header image, it should shrink. And that's actually triggering Python code that's doing that. So, uh, so 
in theory, you could use this um, to even write entire widgets with n without ever going into the DOM uh, and doing any JavaScript coding. But it's kind of implemented as a hack right now. I'm going to post it online so you guys will be able to play with it, but I doubt it will ever be anything official. <laughs> Thank you, John. No, 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 no. He's Actually, oh, you got a yeah. working Thunderbolt adapter here. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Right. Um, my name's Austin Bingham. Hi. Um, I want to talk about Python refactoring with Rope and Trold. Rope is something some of you might have heard about before. Trold probably not because nobody uses it except me as far as I know. So that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, short intro. I'm from here originally, from Austin. Live in Norway now and it's great to be back, so hello. Um, what is Rope? Rope is a Python library for doing Python refactoring. So it's kind of the snake eating its own tail in a sense. It's a cool picture if nothing else. Rope has a bunch of very powerful IDE sort of oriented features. As far as I can tell, that's what it was designed for, to be integrated into IDE. So it does things like code completion, finding definitions, organizing imports, et cetera, et cetera. I forgot to start my watch. So what are the sort of elements of Rope? By the way, this is a pared down version of another presentation. So it's sort of going to be chunkier and funkier than the other one. But if you're in Berlin in a couple weeks at Europython, come see the full presentation. Uh, sort of the central element in uh, Rope is this notion of a project. You sort of point a project object at a directory and it looks at the tree and figures out all the things that are in there. And that's what it can work on. It can do the refactorings on the things in that tree. Um, Another key element is a thing called a resource. A resource is effectively just a directory or a file. So when you have a project, it is essentially managing a bunch of children which are themselves resources. And you can ask about their names and their paths and that kind of stuff. And you can very easily iterate over a bunch of um, all the children in a project. So how does the refactoring work? I'm giving you sort of two moving parts here. So what does refactoring do in, in um, Rope? What does it look like? Uh, the first thing you do is you create a refactoring. In this case, we're creating a name refactoring even a project, and we've told it uh, the resource we want to work on, and the offset is the location into the file, the number of bytes affected, the number of characters into the file that we want to w operate on. What you notice is missing there is we haven't told it what to do, what to rename to. We've just told it a place to do the work. So the next thing you do, once you have a refactoring object, this is a, well, this can fail if it can't do the refactoring, but this is only partially bound. So this is a refactoring you can use over and over. It's kind of a template kind of thing. So the next thing you do is you call get changes and you pass it in the actual name that you want to change to, in this case, case Tacocopter, which was the best business model ever. If you've ever never heard of it, ask me about it. It's very cool. Um, so you you can activate the changes, and then it calculates all the changes, and you can query them, but it doesn't actually do them at that point. So you can actually look at a change before you do it, which is kind of reasonably good. Uh, so a change is fully bound. Finally, you execute the change, and it actually manipulates the files on the, on the drive. So another big feature, this is the most historically accurate picture I could find to put in here. So this is, we're talking about history of changes. Another thing that, that Rope, uh, yeah, it's Abe, Abe Lincoln on a bear with a machine gun. Uh, another thing that Rope handles is history. So you can undo and redo changes. And so it has uh, the notion of its history dictionary, I think, or history list, really, that it maintains. And you can uh, undo and redo to your heart's content. And if you redo transitive changes, they are all done in order. So it's kind of a stack of uh, changes. Very easy to do. You call undo or redo. No big magic there. Uh, one really neat feature that's a bit complicated but very useful is multi-project refactoring. So you can have multiple related projects in different directories, different routes, and have them all affected by the same refactoring. That's very useful. Um, I don't have any de details on it in this talk, though. Finally, it has a bunch of sort of non-refactoring based stuff like find the doc string or find, all the, find the definition of a function or all the use points of a function. So a lot of really useful functionality that um, it's great to have in an IDE that it's missing. And you know, if you use Emacs or Vim with Python, it's a feature that you don't get very easily. And that's kind of why I wanted to invent Trod. Rope is not designed for manual operation. You shouldn't typically be driving it from a Python script. It's designed to be driven by an IDE, because an IDE knows about things like where is your cursor and how big a file is and things like that. It has the information that Rope wants to do its job. So that brings us to the question, what is Trot? And the, the stupid answer is that it's a blah, 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 blah. It's, that's Norwegian. That's a joke. 
trod is Norwegian for thread. And, and here's a pro tip. If um, you ever need to know how to name a project, start learning a foreign language and this use the foreign languages word for whatever it is you're doing. It's, it's, it saves you a lot of time and effort. Norwegian for thread, so rope, thread, haha, it's a joke. Um, what trod really is, is an HTTP JSON server that is written in Python and then uses rope to manipulate the file system to have rope do its thing. Trod is also a, a set of various clients that can talk to that server. So a client for Emacs or a client for Vim or a client for whatever your editor of choice is. So in this picture here you see the IDE is looking at the files, Rope is looking at the files through Trod and they're both kind of working in, in harmony. The, the big, the, the important part here is that Rope is in a separate process from your editor. You, you save yourself the pain of having to embed Rope into something that's probably not written in Python like Vim or Emacs. So why Trod? Why did I write it? Got a few seconds left because this makes integration with editors much simpler. HTTP JSON is spoken by everything in the universe at this point. Um, HTTP is way more than fast enough to do this kind of work, so there's no worry about performance. You don't have to embed Rope to make it do its job. Um, helps you support multiple versions of Python. I'm almost done. Um, and it's the proper level of abstraction. Um, uh, yeah, you can read the slide. So almost done. I'm going to skip the architecture. It uses Bottle. It uses Picket, which is awesome. It uses, looks like this, and there's some other stuff. Um, he's coming, he's coming, coming. You can read my slides. You can read my slides. There's links. Let me know if you're interested in talking about it. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, Austin yeah. from Austin. <laughs> So this concludes our lightning talks for the day. Um, we've just got a couple of announcements before we head off to BOFFs. Um, so uh, the, the first is at the, the BOFF in this next section at 4, 530 on interactive visualization in browser, in the browser, has moved to 1.30 on Thursday. Um, it's correct on the schedule online. It is not correct in the printed schedule. Uh, in its place, so right now, uh, will be volunteering for SciPy 2015. Um, and as Andy would love for all of you to show up for that one. So please, uh, please attend that. Is that, um, I don't know what room that's in, but one oh, that's in room 106. Uh, yeah, it's right on here. So, um, and then that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one more thing. We need a lot more lightning talks. So please sign up tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Let's thank our speakers, too.